All right. All right. So I've got the one seat locked, and that'll be for our friend Roberto. When, this is coffee. Uh, this coffee. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's get started. We got people in the room, so let's uh, let's do this. So this is our first blab together. So hey, this everyone. Thanks for those of you who are uh, hopping in with us. So we're going to jump right in and glad you all could join us today. Uh, my name is Dean Petrolakis. I'm a senior VP for business development at Ryder Dickerson in Chicago. We're a print and marketing solutions provider in this wonderful city of Chicago. And I have two of my favorite peeps here with me today. This is all of our, this is our first blab together. I've done one other blab, but this is the first one I've done with my two friends here. So. I have uh, Deborah Korn and Trish Witkowski here. I'm gonna have both of them introduce themselves to you <laughs> folks in a minute. Does, Deborah will be the resident comedian here. This will be fun. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and we're gonna have uh, a friend of ours uh, pop in, in, a, in a little bit. And of course, those of you familiar with Blab um, know that you can, uh, when the seat is available, you can knock on it and uh, we can let you in and you can join our conversation. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about Leveraging content to grow your audience and, and uh, gain engagement and loyal fans. And we're each going to come at it from a different perspective because we're all doing it in a different way, especially these especially these two rock stars here with me. It's really going to be – I'm going to mostly moderate today and um, allow these two to share some of their wisdom as well as Roberto when he opts in. But let's start with a couple quick intros here. Uh, Deborah, my friend, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to those who don't know you? Um, my name is Deborah Korn, and I am the Intergalactic Ambassador to the Printiverse at printmediacenter.com. I provide information and resources to the print and integrated marketing community with a little fun in the mix. Um, we were practicing value propositions at Print Chat yesterday, so hopefully that was a value proposition. And if you need information and resources and want to have a little fun, you'll check out Print Media Center. Um, I also have very strong ties to the print community. I um, run the Print Professionals group on LinkedIn. It's the number one print group. There's 92-plus thousand members in it, which I started a long time ago by myself, and I've run it by myself since. Uh, weekly print chat reaches over 8 million timelines, lots of social media presence, lots of content. Happy to be here. Try the veal. Trish. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That was awesome. Well, I'm Trish Witkowski from foldfactory.com. I also have another community called rockthemailbox.com. And um, let's see, I'm a designer with a master's degree in print. And um, I have a video series called 60 Second Super Cool Fold of the Week. I've been doing that for about six years. I think almost seven um, you know, 50 videos a year, uh, every single week. I'm on episode 332 this week. Just went out this morning. I just shot it right yeah. there. That's where the I magic happens. It. I watched it already. <laughs> Did you? That's yeah. where the magic it's happens. It's true. Yeah. There's your plants. Right there. There there plants. And the plants. And the plants. <laughs> the fern, the magic fern, <laughs> yeah. we all call magic it. Yeah. Folds between the ferns. There's right. a new, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> that, would be, that would be hysterical. Between yeah. the fern, folds between the ferns would be hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I've been pushing out uh, creative ideas every single week for for six years. We've got um, you know a lot of subscribers to this is to the the full of the week email. We also have a pretty active YouTube channel with about five hundred videos on it, um, one point two million views, and five thousand subscribers to the full of the week email. Uh, the or I mean not the email the um, the YouTube channel. So, you know, we've just grown organically over the years um, through pushing out content, doing a lot of different things. So, yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. And I know when Roberto gets in with us later, he'll tell us a little bit of his story and what he's doing. He's doing some pretty wild things there on YouTube and building up his own little community. So We haven't told um, everybody who's coming. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, told, I, I, I busted our secret. What about you, Dean? Yeah, so it's interesting. So, and it's interesting the connection that the three of us have, you know, through print form, um, which we'll talk about. But, you know, as I mentioned, I, I've been, I, I've worked with Ryder Dickerson. So, uh, as I mentioned, print marketing services. And I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. Um, and really, the last, I would say, probably seven, eight years is where I've seen the biggest growth in my career when um, I got a lot more diversified in what I was doing. And quite honestly, when I started getting involved more in content. Uh, both creation and curation and uh, 
and, and hooking up with people like yourselves, you know, and when I started print form. And that really kind of changed things for me. It put me on the map in a different way. It allowed me to meet some great people in this industry um, and to be, able, to be able to do things like this. So, and I, I, I'm such a firm believer in, and you guys both know this, in, in giving value. Um, and, you know, the last blab that I did was all about adding value to the customer experience. And uh, I'm a firm believer in that, that you should always give more in value than you get back. Uh, and that's the way I kind of roll in my sales career. I always tell people I'm kind of like the atypical sales rep or I'm not out selling people. I'm really more about building relationships and building um, my own, what I would call um, engaged and loyal and community of, of clients. Um, but really it is about that adding value and educating through print form or educating. I'm about to do a, uh, an educational workshop today with a group of college students. They're coming to Ryder Dickerson and we're going to do kind of a print 101 type of deal. And uh, they're a good client of mine and I, I help them once a year, sometimes twice a year do a little uh, educational workshop at our place and kind of taking them from the classroom into the print shop and kind of showing them how it all works and comes together. So yeah, that's just been the way I, I've done things. And uh, I, I, I just find that it's the best way to do. Uh, and speaking of our guest, I'm going to uh, let our guest in because he's knocking on the door right now. So we might as well get him in. Oh, awesome. So let's let our friend Roberto join. Roberto! Yay! Hey everyone, how's it going? Awesome. Roberto's here. Roberto, yeah, the secret guest. The secret yeah, guest. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you just fine. We can see you good. Glad you could join us, man. Great to see you. Great to see everybody uh, face to face to face. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we could pull this off. It's not easy getting uh, everyone's schedules together. So and, uh, We are a motley looking Brady Bunch. I just want to say that. Yes, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's the cool yeah, somebody thing. Should, somebody should screenshot this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it. Go ahead, Deborah. Screenshot Got it. it. Everybody smile. <laughs> Got it. All right. Oh, awesome. Christine. Yeah, put yeah. it out. Put it out. <laughs> so, Roberto, we were just uh, getting into some intros. Um, why don't you uh, give us a little background on yourself, and then we're going we're gonna to pop in and start kind of getting into a little bit of our conversation. But um, just tell us a little bit about and tell the people in the room a little bit about your story. So I'm a creative entrepreneur. Uh, I have 10 years plus experience in design, advertising, and marketing. Uh, really started with uh, web design, ironically, um, before going to uh, print and digital all around. Uh, at this point, I do a lot in the content marketing space, and a lot of it is all around uh, educating and motivating other creative professionals, as well as consulting businesses uh, and brands and what they can do to uh, do exactly what we're talking about here, leverage content, grow their audience, help them with their brand messaging, um, and even the execution on some of their identity stuff, and even the technical nuts and bolts of the execution sometimes. Uh, I'm right now very much well known for the fact that since uh, doing weekly content in 2003 around creative professionals, I've grown a YouTube channel of over 90,000 subscribers. Um, Incredible. It is. Yeah. So impressive. Really? Freaking Roberto, man. <laughs> rocks. More, more, like, I feel those numbers are fantastic. I'm very proud of that because I don't look at them at the, as the vanity metric that other people uh, would because since my channel is a how-to channel, I look at that as customer served. I look at that as people who have been served and have gained value and that I've helped and knowing that, wow, you've helped almost 100,000 human beings. That feels like a real tremendous accomplishment more than, oh, you built a following on YouTube. It's like, no, I helped people in their actual creative journey in their lives. Some people actually now have the job that they want or able to build the career that they want and are on the way to having the life that they want. And that's what I'm you know, really proud of. And it also helped me grow my business, my personal brand. Um, I've been doing speaking engagements. I've been doing a lot more consulting to the point where consulting has overtaken my design and creative practice to where it's more people want to know how to grow their business, get more customers, get some more clients. And after that, then they'll hire me to execute on making their stuff look better. Right. Right. If I could just interject one thing, yeah. it's because you think of your community that way, Roberto, that you have such a such a loyal community. If you were actually trying to sell them something, you would not have 90,000 subscribers. So kudos to you for yeah. just yeah. being freaking awesome. And 
I snagged him to write for News for the Printiverse, just so everybody knows. So subscribe <laughs> to that damn thing and what, read his article. They're very popular. <laughs> they're good. They're good. Stuff. We've been doing that for about, what, a year now? Yeah. And I found you because you were on social media sharing amazing content about making video marketing, quite frankly. And I was like, why is it this guy with me? And thank right. God you said, hey, I'd love to be. So it worked yeah. out. <laughs> Freaking social media. That's how, that's that's how I know you. That's how I know yeah. you. And that's how I know him. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> anyone, true. It is who, true how we all meet. Anyone who underestimates the value of social media is underestimating the value of human connection because it's social media. Media mm -hmm. is the gateway to the conversation. So it's fine to push out, push out things because guess what? If I didn't push out, push out things, there wouldn't be people who decided, I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. So that I can then say, well, thank you for enjoying it. And where'd you get the most out of it? And then we have an opportunity to connect and to grow and to learn together. I built so many relationships through tweets. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah now, the I, fun really is in kind of pushing out, kind of sharing your passion and pushing out great content. I think the challenge, I think for all of us who push out a decent volume of content is, is keeping the quality up you know there's it's it's that you have to keep the quality up you know to keep your community and to keep the energy and to keep people interested so, so let's you know, i think quality. that's yeah so let's the, let's quantify quality because yeah. i think that for, like it's easy to say quality and then people sometimes get confused so regardless of what we're talking about if it's video sometimes people think quality is well i have an hd camera and i have really good right. video. <laughs> That's right. a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. That, the quality that, of the content itself and the, yeah, the material you're creating. Now as print yeah, professionals, yeah. we also know production values matter with everything mm -hmm. as well. So I would say that if we're going to talk about quality. It has to be, yes, the production values of whatever you're putting out there in the world, wherever the content is, but then it also has to be a quality experience. Mm -hmm. And that also means that the relationship value, the customer service value, meaning that if you push something out on social media, well, how good are you at engaging after the fact? And how good are you at following up with people who favorite and like? And how good are you at replying to tweets or to comments? Or mm -hmm. so then there's the, that engagement angle of it after the quality of the production, but then the quality of the content itself, whether it's information or entertainment or infotainment. Yeah. Or motivation or whatever it is. Well, how motivating was it? Or how informative was it? Or how fun was it? Or how fun and informative was it? You know, right. so I think that from my perspective, that's kind of how we define quality content. And I think I should probably do a video and an article about that at some point because I think that yeah. matters. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you just, I just think you just started to write your next article. Yeah. Like that. Um, for, for Media Center's news from yeah. the press. You know, speaking of that, so that's a good, that's a kind of good transition because Deborah, you and I were talking the other day and I, um, Roberto talked about quality. So one of the things you told me is that, you know, you got started not so much through content, but by community. I mean, print production professionals is how you and I met. And one of the things that drew me to your group was that when I joined your group, you sent a personal message to me like you do to probably everybody, I'm assuming, because that's just kind of how you are. And you explain how the group works and then uh, it just right off the bat said it's oh wow this is different than any other group i've ever joined and you said the challenge for you though is once you started to build a community was what were you going to do to keep that community engaged so why don't you speak a little bit about that challenge that that faced you and how you've addressed that obviously you've evolved so much since you and i first met seven eight years ago uh yeah and th and thanks for that um I mean, uh, at a certain point, you know, when I started the group in 2008, it was just me and 30 people, and I was really almost embarrassed. I was like, I need to get my name off this thing. I don't want me and 30 people thinking I have this big LinkedIn group. And then uh, slowly it got momentum, and at about 5,000 people, um, when the um, – uh, uh, people with the, you know, this website came along and said, you know, we have a website, no audience, you have an audience, no website. So why don't we, you know, kind of, uh, you know, make chocolate and peanut butter and make something happen here. Right. So um, pretty much what happened after that is, okay, there was a, a limitation to what you could do on LinkedIn. Uh, there was a limitation to what you could share, how it could be shared um, and how people could engage with it. And, who you could drive to those conversations. So what the group enabled me to do 
was to have a unique perspective about what was topical to the community members because they were discussing it. Then I could take those concepts and go out to the manufacturers and to the printers and to the designers and say, okay, how are you doing this? Because this is very topical and people want to know what's going on here. Uh -huh. So I was able to use content to support the interests of the communities and the community was large enough that it actually gave me access to these people and these companies because prior to me walking in a room by myself, it was like, who is this person? Now I walk in and it's like, okay, it's her, but there's over a hundred thousand people with her. So you, we kind of, it's not like they have to talk to me, but they kind of can't ignore us. And right. um, so content has become a door opener in a lot of ways, as well as a way of serving the community that, I have cultivated. Um, now, I don't believe that I own the print community. I don't, but what I but I serve them in a different way by helping them tell their own stories as well. well so that's it's it's because you've become a a true thought leader and influencer. Um, you know, there's going to be a point where I'm doing um one of my speaking engagements where I do this talk called um the eight E's of thought leadership. And like um, a big section of that is the fact that you can be a thought leader by educating your community and educating the people who are following you, but you can also enable them, you can encourage them, you can empower them, you can help um, eliminate um, barriers to success and excuses, um, you can set examples for them, and also it's your value as an executioner. So you are executing as a print professional, you are then educating not only your community, but then educating the facilitators in terms of the service providers, the, the, the vendors, the manufacturers of saying, look, I have <laughs> access sure. to your base and we're all together and we're talking. So I know these pain points that you're doing, spending millions of dollars in market research to try to understand your community better. It's called, I can reduce that friction a lot. It's called, well, talk to me. I'm in the right. trenches. I'm in the trenches. And also if I go to bat for you, they'll believe me because I've done all this other stuff for them. I've eliminated barriers to success for people. I've set examples for people. I've enabled them. I've educated them. Uh, I've encouraged them. So when I say that, hey, this is reliable, they're more likely to hear it and take mm -hmm. it from me than mm -hmm. from someone else. And that's why influencer marketing matters. And that's why like, you know, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, somebody I'm sure everyone here is familiar with from the marketing world. And I mean, I'm going to shamelessly plug his book right now, The Ask Gary. Yeah, I was just going to talk about that with you, Roberto. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah. there's a whole chapter in here specifically about influencer marketing and something you guys know I'm very passionate about. And just remember, well, back once upon a time as a marketing manager, I used to be a Google AdWords account manager. I was a web designer and SEO guy. And I'm telling you guys flat out that influencer marketing, Human beings like us who build community at, through, yes, we do things with SEO, we do things with this content marketing, but at the end of the day, the network, the net value of our influence and our ability to move that and our ability to monetize messages is going to crush PPC. It's going to crush paid advertising. It's going to crush SEO. It's not going to completely eliminate or replace it, but it's going to be disproportionately more valued because it's more cost effective and more impactful for the businesses shelling out the ad dollars. And I've sat in every chair. I've said in the, oh, I've been a market manager. I've sat in the ad buying chair. I've sat in the, I'm making the ads chair. I've sat in the, we got to, you know, we got to um, sell the ad. I've done every one of these things, buying, selling, making, like, so I've actually the unique perspective of sitting in every one of those chairs. And now as a business owner, I can say, you know what, when my book comes out, yeah, I might do PPC ads with Amazon because of the remarketing and because that will follow people to Facebook and, uh -huh. and I don't have to pay Facebook mm -hmm. and it makes sense. If people trust Amazon, sure. Not to mention like my portions of revenue there, but I would go and I would say, you know what? I'm going to have Deborah review this book. I'm going to have Trish review this book. I'm going to have Dean review this book because it's going to let me access their following. Uh -huh. more, and I'm paying a one-time cost instead of like, PPC mm -hmm. for stuff that may or may not convert, 
they have a loyal following that trust them and that they have influence. So or I can quantify that better. And the thing is, it may cost me nothing. It might be better to give them a copy of the book and a few copies to give away to their audience because then they get the value of traction from running a contest and they can leverage that for whatever they want. Or they could tell people, hey, the next five customers of mine will get a free copy of the book when they do business with me. Like you guys could do whatever you want with a promo. I don't need the control. And also, I don't have to overthink. I don't have to do market research. I don't have to do any of that. You realize how cost effective that is for a business? Yeah. No, and it's, it's true because you just watched it all play out because I know you're a big fan of Gary Vee. So am I. And he, the way he just went about promoting it and you know starting to sell his book was genius. I mean, it's, it's you know, mm -hmm. the guy's a... He's a modern marketing genius and you know, he's got so many good things to say and I can't wait to read his book either. I watch all his shows, but it's true. And he, one of the things Gary talks about and you know, the three of you, you know, can speak to this um, is the idea that it doesn't happen overnight. You know, Gary, Gary was, you know, for seven, eight years was quiet and no one you know, was hearing from him. And now he's out there and he can do all this stuff because he built up the, the, the resume to be able to authentically speak about what he does. You know, Trish, Roberto, mm -hmm. Deborah, you all have done the same thing. And you know, it's interesting, Trish, from your perspective, you know, you you came out of nowhere in a sense, but it really wasn't out of nowhere because you put in all that work before Sappy kind of put you on the map. Yeah, it's it's, it's been crazy. yeah, it's been almost 20 years. I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that about me, but I I've been a, a researcher, uh, you know, uh, for a very long time, and I just started researching folding. It was started it started as a thesis project um, for my master's degree, and then I realized that there were no resources for folding. I realized there was a lot that could be done that nobody knew about, and I started documenting and you know, all of this stuff and collecting all of this stuff. And, and, and the funny part about the video work and what has really put me on the map um, is I, I really just, it, it was kind of on the edge. It was, you know, six or seven years ago before people were really talking about content marketing and before, you know, it was just kind of on the edge of when people were, were putting things on YouTube and experimenting with it. And, you know, and I just said, oh, I'll just do this, this video. I just feel like people need this information. I just, I feel like I have these ideas to share and I can't get to people. And, you know, it, it was an experiment and it turned into what is now a part of my life. I mean, it's a weekly series that, that doesn't, you know, it's indefinite. I don't know. I think I'm going to be doing it the rest of my life. I, I mean, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of this funny thing that just picked up momentum. And I think, um, you know, a, a lot of it has to do with just, uh, you know, that authenticity of just really wanting to share your knowledge. You know, Roberto touched on this, you know, the idea of saying, you know, look, I just really want to share my knowledge and help people. Yes, I'm a business owner. I'm I definitely want to make money. But the content is about the content and it's about educating people and sharing your knowledge and building those those relationships. And, you know, Roberto was talking about doing, you know, the speaking events and things like that and how content has been helpful to his career. And one of the things that I've found with, you know, my, my video work and with doing work, uh, you know, for, for um, sharing ideas with designers and printers and things is that you find, too, that audiences, it's like they know you before you know them and you get this very welcome, like there's, there's like an energy in the room that happens versus hitting a cold room, you know, in like the early days of, doing events where nobody knows who you are and you're kind of like introducing yourself and trying to get you know, some rapport with the audience and you come in and people are like, Trish, you know, it's like you, they, they know you, they're, they're, they're excited to hear what you have to say. And I feel like people leave the energized, they're engaged while they're with you, they're energized and, and they're ready to, you know, they're, they're just, they're soaking in the information and they're excited to go apply it. And, and I, I feel like that momentum and that energy has just increased kind of exponentially over the past few years as I've really picked up speed. I mean, it, it's just, but you, you know, it's a noticeable difference over kind of the earlier days of, you know, trying to kind of get your feet wet and, and establish your, your reputation and all that. You kind of, I don't know where that critical mass is, but at some point you almost hit a critical mass or a tipping point or whatever you want to call it, where all of a sudden it's like, okay, things are clicking. Things make sense. Audiences show up. People are excited. It just, but it, I, I can't put my finger up on when that happens. I think but, it's the number yeah. of executions. I don't think it's yeah. a matter of how much time. I think that everyone over. Oh, Roberto left. Um, I just want to quickly interject that, um, a couple of years ago, Trish and I were at D Scoop together, 
<laughs> and um, it was interesting in this phenomenon of all of a sudden everybody knows who we are. And right. we literally, <laughs> it was like we were like Brad and Angelina. I mean, I can't even tell you. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't walk, we to, couldn't walk together. We were, um, we were hiding behind a column. We, we hid behind a column. Welcome by, back, Roberto. By an, uh, by an escalator, yes. and only people going down the escalator could see us, and they were coming back up the other side to take pictures one time. And like, we were both kind of sitting there like, oh my God, what in the world is going on? It was, it was, it was so, so crazy. Funny. I forgot about that. That was so funny. Okay. That was like the first time, well, that and the first time I went to Graph Expo and there were, I was just walking down the aisle and literally some of the big people from the big men, I mean, those front booths, you know, those, yeah. the, the, the money booths right. were like literally dropping everything they were doing and running out and saying, oh my God, you're, you're Deborah Corn. And I was like, oh my God, uh, <laughs> you know you, what the hell's going on here? You know, like, it was really, really strange yeah. to to have that and i agree i mean with me it's a little different because i just assume that with 92,000 people in my linkedin group that that's how they know me you know but that's not always the case and mm -hmm. to your point i don't know what when it happened either but it's definitely interesting to have that notoriety so to speak it's a little weird and uncomfortable too quite frankly cuz it's like, God, I'm just like, you know, I feel like celebrities, they're like everybody else. You know, it's like, I'm just walking down a trade show aisle here, you know, it's like, and then there's like people surrounding me. So it's, it's very weird, humbling, uncomfortable. But uh, it's fun. It's fun and, and it's fun. fun. Like and there's kind of I'm so, fun. I'm so humbled by that now. Like if yeah. that's the right term for it in the sense that it's like, I respect now what um these people who are, and I don't equate us like I don't equate us with celebrities, but like the word public figure sounds appropriate because it's that when you're recognizable, when you're someone of note, when you're quote unquote noteworthy, we might be in real life the iTunes equivalent of new and noteworthy, but in the real world. Um, and so I because like the internet, of course, the internets know who we are, right? But in the mm -hmm. real world, people are starting to recognize us and take notice of, oh, hey, that's so and so and everything like that. I mean, this is really interesting. And I realized like when I met Gary Vaynerchuk um, at the 92Y event in New York, like how much in real life, he's just seriously a good guy and is really just a guy, a guy who's done amazing and great and accomplished things and is freaking brilliant as a marketer and a business person. But at the end of the day, just a guy in the same way that we've had our accolades and we have our fans in the way that, you know, we're fans of his. We have fans of ours who feel that way about us, you know, in that same way and are very, you know, adamant and passionate. I mean, I there was this like this kid picked me out of like I was a, I was in Manhattan taking pictures um, on the corner of a street testing out something with my iPhone. And like this guy, like actually like picked up his pace and everything like that. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, you're Roberto Blake from YouTube. And I'm like, oh, wow, really? This is happening. So like, I've done that. I've gone to yeah. conventions where I'm just taking photos. You know, I'm actually just an attendee. Like, oh, actually, I take that back. I was a panel guest at that last one. All right, so I was like, I was a panel guest, but I hadn't done my panel yet. And like, there were photographers who like knew who I was. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Cause like they were watching something of mine, even though, I do a little bit of content around cameras and camera gear and photos and everything like that. But I specifically chose not to become a professional photographer uh, to do other things. I'm not a pro filmmaker. Those things are passions of mine and I teach what I do know about them. And I mean, obviously I use my gear every day, but it was just so interesting that the perspective of not even who you would think was going to be a fan of yours or was going to really yeah. take what you say to heart or seriously, it's like, you never know. And so it's just like, it's a great responsibility. It's really fun and exciting, like you said, but boy, is it a little, when, when, it's, when it's your new normal, it's intimidating. Yeah. It's a little yeah. weird. It's like, oh, wow. So it, that, it's, what's interesting here is the fact that, you know, all of you in your own way and in, in me in my own way with, with, with Print Form and Ryder Dickerson, what it all comes back to and, um, is, is the whole idea of the community because none of this is possible without a community of people who want to take in that content because, you can put out all the content you want, 
But even Gary V, I mean, if he didn't have a community of people that that followed him and embraced his content, it would just be that old adage, you know, if a tree falls and no one hears it, did it really fall? So it's the whole idea of that community. And I, and I know that, uh, Deborah, you, uh, you're also a guest writer sometimes for a good friend of mine, you know, Mark Potter with, with Canvas Magazine. I connected you guys and he's... Uh, you, I don't do that anymore, just so you know. Yeah, but you have. And you, you yeah. that was another way that you branched out. And he's a big believer in the whole idea, too, of mm -hmm. community, right? And he's built a community of followers in the print world, you know, when he started Canvas. Trish has her community, obviously, a huge community. Roberto's got a, a, a massive community. So that takes time, though. And I think a lot of people, um, and Gary talks about this all the time, they want to have that overnight success. And they want to they put out that video on YouTube and want it to go viral. And they want their content, they want their blog to get picked up and they want to get all the views and the impressions. And then, then they want to monetize it. How do I make money off it? You know, they see Gary and they want to make all that money that he's making. And what people don't realize is that it takes a commitment. It takes an effort. And none of the three of you got into where you are today without that hard work. And it takes time. And that's the message I think a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, Deborah, like you mentioned it, I mean, you, you started with 30 people and just an idea and, you know, and here you are today now, now, all the big trade shows want you to be there. You know, the Printerverse at, at Graph Expo is like, it's a big deal. SGIA, D-Scoop, all the places you go. But that didn't happen. Drupa. I'm going to Drupa. Drupa. I mean, my God, you're going to Germany. I, I mean, can't freaking hell? believe it. I mean, thank you, HP, is all I have to say. Because quite frankly, they got me before anybody else did. They, they were like, okay, this is a, just a real person talking to real people. And we 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 want to be in on that, and I thank them so so much because, quite frankly, their interest made other people say, "Well, she can't just be with them," you know. But to to your point um, about uh, community, wait, what were you just saying two seconds ago? <laughs> oh, it's about I was talking about the time it takes. The oh, right. Um, thank you, Roberto. For for three years, people asked me what I did. And for three years, my response was, I'm a professional networker. And yeah. everyone just looked at me like I was insane. And the next question was, and how do you make money from that? And my response was, I don't. I don't make a cent from it. However, there is something that's happening here. And I'm in the middle of it. And I'm not going to turn my back on it because... I'm not getting a dollar from it at this moment. I'm not, there's, there's something about, Roberta, you said it before about helping people that really is the underlying reason that I do what I do. Because I get, I can tell you honestly that I am not compensated for more of my time during the day than I'm compensated for my time. Uh -huh. And that's because I am literally spending that time answering those emails that I get in LinkedIn about people looking for resources, about people looking for jobs. I mean, very topical subject. I'm not a recruiter, but I do, because I sit in the middle of all these people, I do know when there are opportunities out there. Um, people looking for resources for work, especially print buyers, who don't want to go public because if they go public, they will get bombarded by the sales forces out there. So they ask me, and I essentially do my due diligence to help them find resources. But if I looked at it as if I can't monetize this hour, I will not be doing this. And if I didn't realize that there was a bigger value in serving a community than monetizing one, I would not be here right now. So that I, is the I, truth. That's a great point, Deborah. That's, that is the truth. I think people rush too quickly to monetize their message before mm -hmm. they ever find their voice, before they ever have a grand vision of what they're trying to accomplish. Like people think, like some people still over glorify, like, and I understand it. I understand why it's impressive. Don't get me wrong. As a marketer, I'm very proud of it. But as a human being, like I said, I'm more about, oh, wow, this is how many people I serve. But like people really hype up the YouTube thing. And I'm like, Guys, understand this is a means to an end. And it's not even just the means to an end of a business goal. I'm trying to disrupt creative services. I am disproportionately trying to take the current model of the attitude and the thought process of creative service professionals, both internally and externally. I want to take it out into the backyard like O Yeller, and I want to put it down.
Okay. <laughs> That's what I want to do because creatives are going through depression and anxiety. They're struggling to, to get jobs. And some of it is not just the marketplace. Some of it is their own freaking fault because they can't get out of their head or out of their own way. There's this overly important narrative to them of the 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 um the starving artist is become a badge of honor, like a badge of honor. Like, no, I need to rip that off of their chest and like burn that thing in front of their face and say, no, no, you like understand your value and understand that you don't have the luxury of just being an artist, you owe it to yourself to respect your craft as a business. You owe it to, to your craft and to the people who came before you to make this thing as valuable as possible and to understand what it's really worth. But then also to the marketplace to educate people to the fact that it's like, no, you do not pay you know, a print uh, production person the same thing as you pay the guy loading unloading stuff off the moving van. You, you don't. You really just don't. And the reason is, one, you're saying that the stakes aren't high enough for you when you do that for what you're doing, which is then you saying to your customer, your consumer, that I don't value your impression of me enough to put quality behind every execution of what represents my brand. And then also you're putting yourself in a position to where someone's not compensated enough to give you their best effort so it's about that re-education and that's what my real goal is more than anything and also knowing the shift in the marketplace and the economy that you can monetize in other ways mm -hmm. that um employers have to step their game up too or everyone's going to become a mercenary and just do it themselves because they have direct access to the marketplace now it's never been easier to build a brand it's never been mm -hmm. easier to build a business um <laughs> Yeah. I mean, just because well, you're out there doesn't mean you have a brand. Just, right. no, just, just to be very clear about that. I'm just saying right. the barrier to entry, the cost to entry, right. has never been lower. Right. The the technical ability you had to have to execute has never been lower. The amount mm -hmm. of people it takes to run a business has never been less because now we have technology and automation and all these resources, and the general public is also more educated about it or could more quickly be educated about it. The turnaround time on becoming profitable, we, you and you guys all know, we're all old enough to know that, that in the world that like we used to live in 10 or 15 years ago, um, you could be in business five years and not be profitable and that would be normal. Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm, so, I, I, my streak is a bit longer than that. Yeah. But, <laughs> So the, the word that keeps coming up here is interesting and is uh, is serve, you know, and serve the community, serve. And, you know, and that's so it's interesting to me because in the last blab that I did with uh, Darcy and with Bob Berg, who wrote The Go-Giver, um, you know, my favorite personal, my favorite book, um, he talks about in the book, it's interesting that you guys are bringing this up. He talks about that, um, you know, the main character in the book talks about, you know, the first question is, you know, when you have an idea or a business idea or a new idea within your business is, well, it doesn't make money. Is it going to make me money? And and the, the 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 theme in the book is well, that's a that's a that's a good question, but it's not the first question. The first question is, does it serve? Does it bring value? Mm -hmm. Right. So then, if it does, the money will follow. And I've always lived my life that way in, in my profession, you know, and 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 selling. And you know, Deborah, you you and I have talked enough about this to know that I'm all about. I talked about this at the beginning of the blab today about adding value. And I certainly believe that if you do the right thing and if you bring value to your customers, the right customers are going to want to work with you and the money will follow. If I'm out there just trying to make commissions all day, that's really a crappy way to, to do my job. Lord knows there's enough sales reps out there that do that. So I, you know, I just choose not to. And I'm just a guy out there who happens to be in the print world doing what I do, you know, just being authentic, being true to who I am. But the idea of serving is interesting to me because you each you know, you're doing this for the right reasons. You're not out there trying to do it. And money's not the first thing on your mind. I mean, Deborah, obviously it's, you, you said it, it's not, you did it for three years and you were a networker and people said, I, I do it today. I do it today. I do it today. It's all about value. Value. It's, um, value. I, I, you know, I was actually having this conversation with Trish before this, uh, before the, our lab today. And I actually discourage people from advertising with me because right. I don't believe that I can serve them in the correct way. Um, I use, um, you know, advertising on my site and in my newsletter and um, to support 
conversations and content that is being provided to, again, serve the need, the need of what's currently going on. Um, and by that, I mean topical and relevant content. Um, there is a big difference between um, my site and like the industry sites, for example, who are serving the community in a different way with the how things work, why they work, why, you know, the markets, the, the economic forecasts and things like that. I focus on, okay, you have this stuff, what are you doing with it? And what are your customers doing with it? And how are you having conversations with them? And what are they being receptive to? And what are the things that they actually care about? So consistently staying in that serving space opens up other doors that mm -hmm. you, you probably won't know are there until you start doing it. But to, to your point, if your focus is strictly on, I'm only going to do this if I make money. I'm mm -hmm. only going to, I, I mean, my, my site, first of all, would look like Craigslist. They would just be flashing and it would look like yeah. a Las Vegas freaking slot machine. I mean, right. with all the dingings and I mean, I want nothing to do with anything. Now, does that make me a candidate for Wharton Business School? Probably not because, you know, every day I'm like, how am I going to pay for my server, you know? which a lot of people would not believe, you know, mm -hmm. but the truth is that my credibility with the community, them knowing to Roberto's point that I'm really only talking about this because I personally think it's freaking cool. Right. Otherwise I wouldn't be yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not doing anything just to help anybody take a corporate message and take it from here and bring it here. Right. There's channels for that. But if it's something that is relevant to everybody that I'm talking with and speaking with and engaging with, then it becomes relevant to me as well. And I can help push and pull those conversations if so I want to get the information that they need. And, and I think that authenticity translates. You know, I was kind of talking about authenticity earlier about how I think people can tell when you really do want to help and when you're really there i mean obviously everyone knows you've got to make money somehow but that you know you, you don't sell out you know you're authentic and you're true to your audience and for me it was all about um a niche really i found a niche that i was interested in i created the resources that i really wanted that i felt as a designer didn't exist it took a very long time just to prove to the industry that there was a need for this this category I mean, you know, and, and, and it started as folding, but what's happened over time, I mean, folding's still my, you know, strongest kind of competency because I've been studying it for so long, but, but it's it, because I field so many questions from, you know, viewers and, you know, people that I meet, it's actually broadened into a lot of other research. And now I research, you know, and, and speak on direct mail, engagement strategy, generational preferences in marketing. I do a lot of work on uh, millennial marketing. Um, you know, and, and, and I've started to, you know, package my content into a series called Event in a Box, where, you know, they're, they're, they are speaking events that are kind of contained and they've got handouts and materials. And I, I've found that, you know, when you create so much content, you've got to kind of find a way to, to turn it into something. And I think that's where it becomes, you know, okay, how do you turn it into things that people really want and that really help them? And that you know can create the, either a series or you know some some amount of, of longevity. So you know it's led to lots of other things. Um, you know, but but for me it was really finding that that niche and creating um, a following and establishing it in the industry and becoming kind of the person that everybody looks to for that category and kind of owning it. You know, right? I, I just just want like to say one, one thing about Trish presenting. Um, we were at an event um, a couple of weeks ago at the Advertising Projection Club of New York. And um, first of all, uh, talking about authenticity, you know, when Trish is showing these amazing pieces that she's highlighting for the, the fabulousness that is print, you know, she's telling you about, oh, this one was great. I was pulling it for half an hour, you know. And um, so you know that she really has an attachment to these things. They're not just pieces that she's propping up there because they serve some other purpose. Also, as far as serving the community, 
I'm sorry I have to tell the story because it's okay. my favorite. Very funny story. Trish has just announced the fold file. Is it everyone's, anyone screaming out there? <laughs> um, and when she announced it, it's this really cool thing. Just go to foldfactory.com and find it. Trust me, you'll freak. <laughs> Anyhow, when she announced it at this event, it was like when Oprah was giving away cars. <laughs> you remember? It was like, you get a car. This, these people literally lost their mind in the audience. They're like, what? Oh, my God. I mean, they were freaking out over this whole file. So talk about understanding the community and serving a need and making a product and service around what they are interested in. Mm -hmm. This was the, I have never seen a product that is for sale, mind you, get a standing ovation. I yes, I want to buy this from you. I believe. I had to give me. the guy in front of me my handout with the information on it because he was freaking out. He's like, I don't know how to get it. Why, why, why? I was like, here you go, sir. And he's like, wait, no, you can't get one. I'm like, it's okay. I'm sure I can get one from Trish. It's okay. I mean, literally, the guy needed like a freaking Xanax. It was crazy. But it's a perfect example of what we're talking about uh, here. Yeah, and I believe that. And I personally have seen Trish. You know, Trish, I think, what is it now, four or five times you've spoken? Yes. At so... I've seen, fun event. And you've covered the gamut, right? The, you've spoken on everything from folding to direct mail yeah, to, like, to millennial to millennials. And so yeah, it, what's interesting there is it, you've obviously been able to evolve and in, in your brand to be on, you know, obviously being known as the folding fanatic with the cute t-shirts and all that stuff. And now it's, you know, it's, I laugh every time I see you without the t-shirt. It's still out of yeah. context for me. But it, what do you mean without? What? Kind of yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. she, she says she has other clothes on. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. Let's be clear about that. Yes. Let's be clear about that. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is being recorded. It's a family yes. program. Yes. Yeah. Well, Brady Bunch situation. That brings yeah. up the point of like pivoting and uh, pivoting and rebranding. Pivoting. Um, yes. You know, at pivoting. The, as you find Genius. your your voice and what your overall your larger vision is, and also responding to what your community wants from you and like what you how you've grown in the relationship. Because the thing is, your community will actually bring your best content out of you. So many people say that yes. they struggle with what to do or how to like. They're like, how do you keep coming up with content or how do you keep coming with ideas or how do you be so consistent? It's like. There's a once there's a demand, it's not hard. It's right. You're right. You're right. And actually, one of my videos that's had uh, the most, one of the most watched videos was uh, I had a viewer send me a note when the USPS folded self mailing standards were changing, yeah. and he sent me a note and he said, you know, of all people, I would think you'd you'd have something to say on this. Are you putting out a wit a video? And it was like I hadn't thought to do that. And you know, so then I was like, you know what? I do need to put out a video about the new FSM standards and you know, it, it became a really kind of a go-to resource for the community. And it just was kind of this funny thing that came out of a viewer, you know, suggestion. So it is, it's your audience starts to tell you where to go. And, you know, the questions that they ask, the questions you get at events, the questions you get, you know, weekly or whatever, or through email um, really do lead you to, to kind of go into different areas. And for my, for my content, I, you know, I kind of pivoted, I love the word pivot, pivoted into, into direct mail because people were kind of saying, you know, uh, they, they were asking me, well, can you give me some ideas for, you know, where, what I should choose, you know, for my format, for my project. And I, I found I had to keep kind of stopping them and saying, well, you know, wait a minute, who's your audience? You know, what, what's your goal? Where are you, you know, what are you trying to do? And then I realized I needed to put format choice into context for people, into a workflow of, wait a minute, you know, you start with your list and here's how you make that happen. And then, you know, boom, 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 further down the road, format. But it was kind of putting it into context really was what kind of made people connect the dots. And also, I think, is, is helping people um, to be more strategic. And I think now I look at everything. In the beginning, I was looking at everything just for format, for what it was. And now I look at everything from how engaging is it and what other engagement strategies are working, are in play right now in this format. And I think it's also made my my presentations and my content richer, deeper, more effective. And so I think you do. You find that your audience leads you to your next, you know, body of content or your next kind of avenue, um, you know, as you go, which is kind of neat. You know, before I mean, we this, go to uh, anything else, you know, I, what I think would be the most helpful to the live audience and to anyone watching the replay 
because we've gone like a lot all over the place. Let's talk about some actual ways to leverage content and monetize um, content and even speak to our own strategies and personal experience with that because I think that we have a lot of like, maybe not this audience, but I think in general, like there are cynics out there who don't believe in this and they are very much adamant about businesses exist to make money, businesses exist to make money. And I would caution them to the remember that Blockbuster wanted to make money too. Look at where they are and everything like that because right. they didn't listen when we were all whining about want, not wanting to drive out in the rain, show up to the video, not be there, get something because we don't want to leave empty handed, go back home, really not be interested in watching it, watch it the last day, get there at closing, and then have to pay late fees the next day Like versus, oh, click a button. I've got it. Like they didn't listen. And then they thought arrogantly, you know what? We've been in business 25 years this Netflix thing, you know, we're not going to buy them out. They're not going to beat us. We'll just try and steal the same thing and everything like that after we've already sullied our reputation, after they've already dominated in that space. Yeah, we can just mimic them. It'll be fine. Where are they now? Oh, wait. Nowhere to be found. Wait, their entire, not just them, their entire business model evaporated in less than five years mm -hmm. because they didn't listen, wanted didn't to listen. make money, yeah. didn't want to create value, <clears throat> didn't want to you know, have it, you know, uh, uh, Kodak, anyone film? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Same thing, Deborah. Cameras, Deborah. digital cameras, digital cameras. Well, hey, I, Deborah, think I would, I'd go one step further with that too, just to, to stick it to the print industry. I look at a company like Heidelberg, you know, Heidelberg let, I mean, I mean, Heidelberg was the, was the, the be all end all. I mean, you went to graph expo years ago. You walk through that floor, Heidelberg owned the front of that show floor. Right. right. You buy Heidelberg. <laughs> right. Now that show is not owned by Heidelberg anymore. I mean, if I yeah, was. But, but I'm sorry, I would have to argue with you that when you're Heidelberg, you don't need to go to a trade show. Just like you don't no. need to, you don't get, you don't get direct mail for Lamborghinis. No, you don't. Say. But I would, I would argue and tell you that Heidelberg missed out on the digital revolution and let HP steal it right from underneath them. That's a different story, but right. but whether or not to spend money on going to a trade show when yeah. everyone knows who you are versus just, quite frankly, look at their business model as as the pivot, which right. is let me bring the qualified people I know can actually afford these presses and right. have a, a need for them, specifically market to them, specifically invite them to events tailored for them, show them exactly what they could be producing in their wheelhouse, show them the vertical markets they can serve with this same machine and spend the money that way. So I mean, when Connor right. said, let's sell our consumer technology to Sony and let's just go and use, focus on our microscopes and telescopes with the government and NASA, and let's just do that and hear our consumer grade technology and patents. Here you go, Sony, you go have fun with that. Right. right. I think so it's, it's a pivot. It is a pivot. It is a pivot. So my point with Heidelberg was that I mean, look at D Scoop. Look at uh, HP is done with D Scoop. D Scoop is oh, is, is their best users' best. community, right? I mean, it's it's a brilliant idea, and quite honestly, it was the inspiration for Printform for me. You know, building a community that same way. Everything I've done with Printform, I kind of took mm -hmm. my inspiration uh, from from D Scoop, and it was a brilliant idea by HP. And to your point, Deborah, about about listening to your community and giving them a place where they could could have discussions. And they could bring ideas to that community. So um, the idea of of listening and Roberto is so is so funny. You mentioned that word listening because I was gonna when Trish was talking about shifting and pivoting her content. I really do think it comes down to listening mm -hmm. constantly. Whether you're in a in a profession like mine where I'm day to day dealing with clients and I have to always be listening constantly because that's where you're gonna get your greatest in insight is listening to your customers or like you guys listening to your audience and engaging <laughs> what is of interest to them and pivoting, right? It, it, so, mm -hmm. and again, back to Gary Vee, he talks about that all the time. That's why he's so engaged with this community because he's always wondering, putting out content and seeing what, what they're really engaging with and what, what people are posting comments on. And shame on you if you're not taking action on that engagement. So that word really comes back to the forefront for me there is, is the idea of listening and engaging. And you guys do such a great job of it. There's enough people out there on Twitter and that are just posting comments and never they post stuff and they never they never engage with their followers and they never listen to them and that's I, I think there's a lot of noise out there right, right. now you know right. and so the, the 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 challenge is to to stay authentic and unique and valuable you know and to to provide content that people actually are willing to stop and and look at and listen to or whatever and and something that they 
that they um, look forward to. I think the struggle that companies have, like we're we're individuals, right? I mean, Dean, you you're with Ryder, but I mean, we're the rest of us are, you know, we're individuals, kind of in control of our what we're right. what we're doing. You know, I put out what I want to put out. You know, there's nobody kind of saying, well, run that through legal first right. and make sure you do this and make sure you do that. I think what a lot of times companies uh, have trouble with is is you know, content. One, it's hard to attribute its its kind of monetary value, you know, as a marketing expense, you know, you're paying, a, if, if they're paying writers or if they've got a team doing this, it's hard to, I think, often attribute it to, you know, uh, the, the bottom line, you know, and, and money coming in. And so I think it's it's hard from less, from that standpoint. Um, less than what, less than you yeah. would think, I think, is that they, they purposefully choose to have that narrative because they choose not to educate themselves on it so that they can continue doing what they're comfortable with. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And I think I've seen that a lot because the thing is, think about how hard it was and how hard it is to measure the value of having a freaking billboard or any other OOH, and for those who are not in the know, out of home advertising, mm -hmm. right? And romantically, do you realize that billboards, and Gary Vee brings this up, and like I, I didn't even mean to bring him into this part of the conversation because I was just thinking of it because I used to do billboards for the ad agency. I did like the HBO boxing stuff for Times Square. But thinking about for an event marketing venue like them and their HBOs, yes, that makes sense. But if you're someone who's not HBO, still the creme de la creme of businesses that be able to say, oh, yeah, we've got a billboard downtown or, oh, we've got a billboard off of Highway you know, 95 or whatever. And it's like – why do billboards in an age when everyone's still looking at their smartphones as they drive by still cost what they cost five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Why is that? Why is that still that valuable? It's because people are still spending money on it and still willing to spend that money on it. And not because it has any measurable ROI, but because it's what they're comfortable with and because the, it, mm -hmm. it, in their mind, it associates with prestige. Print ads – without leveraging a QR code or a unique website URL to track, because you can make print measurable if yeah. you want to. And we did an article about that, if I'm not mistaken. You can make print measurable, and I'm not throwing print under the bus. What I'm saying is that romantically, people are not thinking of going this other way of saying, well, can I make QR codes interesting? Because guess what? Snapchat is crushing it with their snap code, which is just a glorified QR code. So it's not right. impossible to, or why not use as a brand? Why not use in your print uh, thing, your snap code, if you want to reach millennials, if that's who your audience is and everything, and put that in your print ad or even on your freaking billboard and have a unique story of the day curated through there, or even have an influencer take over the account for a day. And this is why influencer marketing is going to crush it because- of all the people like us, it's going to work because just like you said, if they decide to just outsource it to us, the legal ramifications of just hiring an influencer are much less than dealing with the red tape approval of multiple managers and multiple departments and a CEO. And to say, and it's also cheaper. It's also cheaper to leverage an influencer than to sit there and have to pay multiple people on a marketing team to do that particular thing mm -hmm. and then run the day-to-day -day internal operations and your marketing team can just go to auditing basically. Yeah. So let's, um, we've got just a couple of minutes left here and I, I'm, I'm really interested to get each of you just for a minute to comment on this. So we've covered a lot of ground here. This has been a great conversation, really has been. Um, Tell me, each of you, what what, do you, what excites you about the next coming years in terms of in perspective to your businesses and what we're talking about here with content and platforms for engagement? Deborah, you start. What, what, what excites you the most? I mean, honestly, I have to say that going to Drupa is something that um, I really feel that I'm going for everybody here. I mean, I'm going for my people. And um, as much as I'm specifically going there to work with the HP's page wide press, uh, the, those are the high speed inkjet presses. Um, but, and I will be there um, helping them to, uh, they're working with a bunch of partners there. So I will be there to help the community understand how everyone is working together. But when possible, I plan on taking my video camera and walking around and seeing as much as I can so that everybody else can come, can be with me there. And I'll be taking, I don't want to call them requests, but literally, what does everybody want to see? I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, we could all name the, the top five things. I'm sure Mr. Landis Booth is, uh, you know, number one is they're going to be press, you know, um, but I plan on doing as much as po much periscoping as possible, as much video, as much tweeting, social media. I mean, beyond my responsibilities there to really 
give as much of that experience to not give it, but literally share it with yeah. everybody yeah. because I am very lucky that I get to go to these events now, but as you know, sitting in an advertising agency, it's like the production people don't go anywhere. We don't even get to go to for lunch. Let alone someone's gonna, <laughs> no one's going to send me to freaking Germany for three weeks. You know, they're not going to send me to Chicago. They're not even going to let me go to the Javits center, you know? Yeah. So, so, uh, so it's not happening. Um, and then, of course, it's in Europe, so there's all the, uh, just the Americans in general don't get to go. So <clears throat> I am looking at this opportunity as so much bigger than myself. I will do all the work, everything I need to do so that HP is happy, of course, and then I am running the hell all over that show to, to see as much as possible and share as much as I possibly can with everybody. That's great. Trish, what about you? What, what, what excites you about all the stuff we talked about and going forward about your business and your community, what, what, what's got you excited for the coming couple of years here? Well, you know, what, what I'm, what I would say I'm most excited about is I think, you know, for a while, everything was digital, digital, di you know, everything was, you know, e this and, you know, I think there's kind of a rediscovery of tangible media that's happening now. We're all absorbing, you know, processing like eight hours a day of, of, of media and most of it's digital. And so there's like this rediscovery of print where tangible media has meaning. There yeah. we go. There it yeah. is. So, 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 you know, That's a so, book, everybody. That's, that's a book. book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And I, I just feel like it's, it's a huge opportunity where, you know, people are kind of saying, well, wait a minute, I actually do look forward to my print. I do look for, and there's neuroscience behind all of this that's proving it as well. And so I think we, we've got this wonderful opportunity to, to kind of leverage the strength of that. And I feel like I can go out, I can be an advocate of it. I feel like people understand what I'm doing now. It's, I feel like I was a little bit ahead of my time, um, you know, in the earlier days. And I feel like print finishing has caught up, um, you know, digital print has caught up. You can do amazing things with digital. You can still do amazing things with, with offset, you know, I mean, look at what's happening with inkjet. Just everything has kind of picked up speed and packaging and large format, you name it. So I just feel like it's all about print right now. And um, I'm excited to be in that environment. I don't know. I'm excited to be an advocate for, for the industry. And I'm excited to, to, instead of having, you know, at the end of a, of a presentation, like, Oh, well, you know, we love what you're doing, but no, we can't do that. And this can't mm -hmm. be possible. Now it's like, people are like, wait a minute, this is awesome. You know, let's, let's do this. I want to try it. I want to do something new. I just feel like um, there's tremendous momentum with what can be, you know, done. And I don't know, it's just exciting. It's an exciting time. Um, I feel like things have kind of all connected and you know you For get the sure. moment i'm going and ride the wave it's fun yeah it's it's I, I, you're speaking to the choir there um, <laughs> roberto what about you what um, about definitely you? living in exciting times i mean um this past year has been really exciting for me uh i'm really looking forward to doing more speaking engagements attending more conferences um and doing the video and the behind the scenes and doing the interview stuff i love that um I'm really excited to be writing uh, my book, the Just Create Awesome book, uh, building a mindset for creative success. That's going to be a really, uh, it's a, it's an, it's an undertaking in and of itself. But I'm so excited about it, and I'm so excited that I decided to make the decision to actually interview a bunch of uh, these other creative professionals that are going to be featured in the book. People like Subi Zimmerman, um, Amy Schmittauer, Tyro Roxon. It's going to be like fantastic. And it's gonna help so many people in my community and it's gonna bring so many more people to my community. And like, I'm really excited about the fact that like with what I've been able to do, I've been able to get people, whether they're print professionals or web designers or photographers or videographers to actually start talking to each other and actually understanding what they have in common instead of just sitting in their own silo in their own zone. So like personally, I'm really excited about that. As far as where things are going, I'm really excited about something we never touched on here which is I'm really excited about augmented reality and VR. And I think that it's actually going to help print a lot because I, I agree with that, you. Um, I think that print, and I also think things going on with 3D printing. And I think that like with print material and with out of home advertising, this is where I am excited about the value of out of home advertising. I'm interested in it as a trigger for virtual reality experiences. I'm interested in print products triggering VR. And so I think that print like is going to get really exciting there mm -hmm. because print becomes very practical and affordable when you start thinking about it in those kind of terms as a gateway media. Yes. And I think that that's going to be so cool. 
and then marketers are going to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> well, marketers always tried that. They tried to ruin it with QR codes. Everyone jumped in and was using them in the worst ways possible. So they it's, ruined uh, them in the U.S., but not yeah. abroad. No, it's true. Like, if you're in Asia, shopping is really convenient with a QR yeah. code. Yeah. I wish we had that here. Oh my God, I wish I could just like you know be walking around somewhere and then there's just nothing but products and QR codes. Like, oh my God, I need to pitch Amazon on on print kiosk. Uh, yeah, like, it's gonna be it's gonna be sensors. There's, there's yeah. no need for a code anymore. It's just yeah. it's just gonna that's be sensors. That, you're not wrong. That's the evolution of it. I think that's the real evolution of it. Oh, and, and mm -hmm. then with VR, I think the evolution of it is then um being able to actually get like a 360 view of the product and everything like that. Which oh my god, the unboxing guys are gonna hate this. <laughs> everything everything is going to work off your cell phone camera. You're not gonna need to do anything. You're just gonna point at it, and it's it'll take you to the shops you can buy this outfit from. The shoes that go with it, it'll be crazy. But no, I know we have to go, Dini. You no, want to wrap no, it up? Fine. No, it, this has been a, this has been awesome. We got to do this again. So you guys, uh, thanks for everyone who. Uh, we had a lot of viewers popping in out, so this was great. Roberto, thanks for uh, for joining our posse here today and rounding it out. It was great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I absolutely. Think we should move print chat to blab. Have you thought about that, Deb? <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't anybody listen. I have enough time with the time change. I'm not having a location change. I lost all of Europe yesterday because, and Australia, it's too early. The Australians cannot get up at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It's, been, it's been up, they get up at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so for the next three weeks, print chat's all over the place. So oh, like, okay. maybe, curse you, farmers. Yeah. I, I did the other day, Christine, I was going crazy with the farmers. Yeah. Well, listen, you guys, uh, you guys have a great rest of your week. And like I said, thanks for, for popping in with me. This was fun. All right, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks right. so much for inviting us. All right, guys. Everyone have a great day. Bye. All right, Bye. take care, everybody. Trish, just log out. Log out. See you, Trish. Log out, Trish. <laughs> oh, God. Bye, Trish. Bye.